I love this part of the show because I'm going to interview a friend of mine here. He's a professor, an author, uh, a, a, an all-around good guy, intellectual. He wrote this great book that I have right here with me, and I'm going to show it to you. It's called The Long Crisis. If you get a chance, I really recommend you check it out. The Long Crisis. I'm professional, so I'm going to stand it up here. He's used to talking at, like, fancy colleges and everything, and here I am setting up the chairs as I introduce him. <laughs> All right, but he's an amazing author, super nice guy, very smart. He's gonna, we're gonna have a great talk about, about his book, about his work. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Benjamin Holtzman, everybody. Come on up, Benjamin. I'll sit over here. Oh. There you go. Give it up one more time for Benjamin. How you doing, Ben? I'm well, thank yeah? you. All right, cool. Well, welcome to the uh, welcome to the interview portion. I know you're used to doing academic interviews and impressive universities and impressive people. <laughs> but no, this is, this is really great. I mean, I have to say, like, this is really cool that all of you are obviously this is meant to be like entertaining. You have comedy, but it's really cool to have people come out to want to like talk about history. I'm going to steal some of the stuff that you did in your presentation in my student lectures. I'm going to amp it up a bit. You inspired me. So, uh, more memes, Please I think. Please don't amp yeah. it up anymore. No, no. Uh, okay, well, yeah, well, thank Thanks. you. All right, well, let's get started then. First question right out of the bat. This ain't your grandma's interview show. <laughs> this is the tough stuff. So let's get into it. How are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm well. It's this is. I, I'm just gonna say it again. This is. This is fun. This is nice. I think. <laughs> He's like, oh, it's still a little early to call. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I wanted to talk about your book. So it's called The Long Crisis. It's called New York City and the Path to Neoliberalism. Now, uh, generally speaking, I'm gonna throw it out there. This is. We don't have enough time to get into like as the definition of neoliberalism, but it's basically the trend of you know uh, privatization, the trend of subsidization, the basically making things, taking things out of the public sphere into the private, free market, etc. Now, what's interesting, we had Sharon Zukin uh, come on the show, and she talked about you know gentrification and all this. But what's interesting is, I guess. What, what this book says is that gentrification is kind of the symptom of a bigger disease, which you're kind of saying is neoliberalism, right, in that sense. Could you expound on that a little bit? Uh, and, uh, you know, keep in mind, we only have like half an hour here. <laughs> you know, it's like, keep it concise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that, so you did a great job Thank of you. kind of articulating what uh, neoliberalism is and a kind of snapshot. And, and this really comes into being a more prominent governing philosophy in the 1970s and especially in the 1980s, right? And so I think one way of kind of, you know, getting at like an issue of gentrification is, and, and you know, and maybe this is, is obvious to some people, but one of the ways that gentrification often gets kind of thought about is as an individual basis, right? So individuals kind of moving into the city and moving into particular neighborhoods, right? What I think that overlooks and what I think maybe a kind of neoliberal lens kind of adds is thinking about the policies that are enacted to encourage that. So my book is about New York in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and one of the things I do in the book is think about the kind of policies, tax subsidization, subsidi subsidi well, I, <laughs> I do, I am actually a He's like, I'm a writer, all right, dude, relax. inability to pronounce yeah. words. Yeah, yeah. Subsidizing yeah. various kinds of development, really fueling the destruction of what were called single room occupancy hotels, where we're sort of housing for indigent uh, and, and poorer folks, and those kinds of things that were actually, you know, really um, underlaying a lot of the gentrification that was happening during that period. So kind of thinking about so how the, the bottom-up processes of where people are doing on an individual basis kind of meet um, the policy level changes that were trying to intentionally fuel gentrification in the city during this period. Right, and I, I think what was interesting too about the book and, and the way you approached it is that neoliberalism is something that transcends party. It's, an, it's a trend, and, and I, I watched one of your interviews that you did before. The interviewer wasn't as good as me. <laughs> but I watched one of your interviews before, and it was interesting, your, the phrase you used is that no one considers themselves or claims themselves to be a neoliberal. That's not, it's basically a trend that you spot in hindsight. You look at how things kind of develop. And so this is one of the reasons why it doesn't matter who's in mayor, who's the mayor, or who's the president for that matter, because it's a trend also at the national level. But I thought that was an interesting point, that it is, it's, a, it's kind of about the movement of capital. Mm -hmm. And uh, you talked about how it kind of co-opted certain citizen movements, citizen gra grassroots movements. 
Uh, I thought that was really interesting. And, uh, and I, I'd like for you to speak on that. And also, why is that important? Uh, why do you think it's important that these things started out as citizen movements? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll just start Sorry, going that was a lot. If that I was a lot. Sorry. Go, I drank yeah. a lot of coffee. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me know if I'm going on too long. Yeah, sure. but, um, so one of the things, the book kind of starts in the late 1960s and, and 1970s. And, um, and that's a period, as, as many of you I'm, I'm sure know, right? The city is really in an economic crisis. It's running out of money, right? It almost goes bankrupt in the mid-1970s. Um, it's a, it's a kind of, you know, it's a dark period. And so um, what I'm trying to do in the book, or one of the things I do in the book is really look at how people in their own neighborhoods and various kinds of neighborhoods of New York were responding to declining conditions in the city, right? And who are initially, you know, going to the city government and saying, you know, we need a, we have a problem with our park system, right? We have a problem with crime in our communities. We have a housing problem. And they're really consistently being told no because the city does not have the money to address it. So I try to trace, or I trace a number of initiatives that are launched at a kind of grassroots level to solve problems of neighborhoods throughout the city during this period of economic crisis and show how over time they're part of a process that will, by the 1980s and 1990s, really help to catalyze what ends up being uh, a greater role, like the way you described for neoliberalism before, a kind of greater role of the private sector, business, the market in city life in all sorts of, uh, of ways. What I think that you ask sort of what that does, mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things it does is that it, it helps to kind of, well, it just tells a different story of how that history right. happened, right? We tend to sometimes think of this as a kind of um, a very top-down process, right? And I think this kind of shows the almost unintentional ways that it happened. These citizens in the Lower East Side or in the Bronx or Clinton, aren't necessarily um, launching these initiatives because they think that the private sector can do so much better than government. They're not like market, you know, free market ideologues. They're just trying to solve a problem in their neighborhood, right? And over time, they're part of a process that will lead to greater, you know, things like privatization, those those kinds of initiatives. Um, but it's it's sort of an un unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, and it's also interesting, uh, just to give you an idea of an example for uh, would be Central Park. You use Central Park as an example. I don't know if you guys know this, but Central Park is run by the Central Park Conservancy, which is pretty was a private organization that makes almost 90% of its money off of private money. So obviously, who lives around Central Park, right? The most, the richest, most powerful people in the entire world. So they get a lot of money in donations. You can go and sit on Madonna's bench. Literally, there's a bench that says Madonna's bench on it. Uh, definitely put a towel down before you sit on that one. <laughs> uh, but, but anyways. It's a, place, it's a place where you have all these people who, who have a lot of money who donate to the park, but that's, and it's great because you go to Central Park today and it's cleaned up, it's nice, but the problem is you end up, and you pointed this out, you end up creating like a two-tiered system of parks. You go to other parks and other neighborhoods and obviously you fill in the blanks, you, ha you don't have as much money, especially if the city cedes more and more control to private interests. So that's an example of how it happened. Um, I, I, maybe you can, I guess, expound a little bit on that example to kind of uh, show people, I guess, how that works. Yeah, so it's a, right, so I think it is a really interesting example. And we, we now, you know, and it's, as, as you're pointing out, it's not just Central Park, Bryant Park, you know, Matt, sort of pick your park, especially in Manhattan, and it tends to be run by a private nonprofit organization, um, you know, by and large. So it's a really profound transformation in, in the public spaces of this city, right? Um, and so I, I, link that back in part at least to what I was describing earlier, right? A lot of citizen movements and resident movements in the 1970s who were, you know, in various parts of the city, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, kind of saying, you know, our park is falling apart. You know, we need to do more, we need to get together and say, hey, maybe the city can, should really loosen its control of the park and they need to open it up to volunteerism, to private donations, right? They weren't the only, like sort of neighborhood people weren't the only pe people who were part of transforming the park system. I'll also show how some of these, you know, more powerful interests, uh, people like Richard uh, Gilder and, and various people who are kind of uh, behind the conservancy who are really wealthy individuals who come to see the way that enhancing Central Park can then enhance their own real estate 
you know, value. Not to say that they don't also have a kind of municipal interest and, and that they're not kind of doing it for the goodwill of the park, but how those, those then intersect, right? The, the kind of citizen-led movements kind of will intersect with those more kind of um, top-down, you know, wealthy individuals and really help to transform the park system as a whole. Right, and, and, and in, the park, in Central Park's case, and you talk about this in your book, it started out as volunteers. People just right. going to clean up the right. park. This is how it started. People would go and they'd say, hey, they'd put on some gloves, clean up the park, make a day of it. And then that oh, slowly evolved into collecting funds. And then that slowly right. evolved into right. collecting big checks. Right. And then mm -hmm. those people with the big checks kind of start steering it a little more and it, and it slowly evolves into what we know today. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly. Now, it's interesting, uh, along those lines, uh, I, I think before I ask you a little more on that, I wanted to also talk about uh, bids. I think this is super interesting. I think uh, people don't really realize this happens. There's dozens of them all over the city, uh, you know, ranging in amounts from like in the millions of dollars to the hundreds of thousands of dollars. That, and what a, bid's, a bid is is a business improvement district. So when you go to Union Square, for example, that is pretty much privately run by a business improvement district. So when you see people wearing like the, the Times Square Alliance on their shirt, the security guards, the people cleaning, those are people who are working for that bid. Now, it's clean, it's safe, but it's not really democratic. It's, it's actually a, a group that's basically running it, and it, that group is made up of people from around that area who put into this fund, and they've gotten these powers from the city to tax each other, et cetera, and be able to, to pick up money. Um, what do you think, I guess, uh, obviously the positives are obvious, it's clean, it's, you know, it's safer in a lot of places. What would you say are the drawbacks of something like that? Yeah. So, and I think that that's the question, right? Yeah. Like, it's not so much to say that something like the prolifer the growth of business improvement districts, which are typically, especially in Manhattan, run by large property owners. So, like the the owners of commercial real estate, you know, the kind of big owners of of, of you know, the to go back to the alt Occupy Wall Street, the sort of one percent of the city who mm -hmm. are often really behind these business improvement districts, particularly in in Manhattan, right? Who are then able to exert. A, a, a really extraordinary influence over the public spaces of the city, as you're suggesting, both you know, private security, um, uh, sanitation, also sometimes changing uh, aspects of the landscape uh, of the city, right? Changing kind of aspects of streets and things like that. So I think that that's a question, right? Like, do we necessarily want um, those large business owners to be able to exert that kind of influences over the public spaces, right? And so I think for those people who are, say, concerned about the growth of policing, right? Oftentimes these, or, you know, um, some of the, you know, very important poignant critiques of policing and over-policing that have been made, these private security forces um, that are less accountable um, and that are often working in concert with police, right? I think, you know, having private security forces on the, on the city streets that are then, you know, largely accountable to these, more to these property owners than a kind of public sector or greater public, you know, um, citizenry, right? I think that might be at least worth questioning, right? In terms of some of the costs and some of the trade-offs, right? Who gets pushed out of these spaces, right? Because they seem like they don't necessarily belong in them. Again, I think it's a kind of question about like, do we want to allow um, large property owners to make those kinds of decisions ultimately? So those I think would be some of those kinds of trade-offs. All right, let's go guys. City Hall, come on. <laughs> We're following Ben, uh, but no, I think you're. I think you're right. I think that that's that is kind of like uh, you know. It's I guess you're making a deal with the devil a little bit. It seems like. I, sorry if that's uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> please don't turn me into Eric Adams. Uh, but you know, uh, but no, it, it is kind of in a way because you know you get the the it's cleaned up and everything more quickly. You don't have to be the bureaucracy, but at the same time, you know, back in, it, it can come back to bite you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when they decide what goes and what doesn't, right? Yeah, and we've seen yeah. a lot of examples. I mean, it's a similar kind of you know example of the park system, right. like you're sort of you, you were pointing to before in terms of the inequities that resulted in the kind of switch right. of this overall system, right? right? And we saw the inequities of the park system. There have been some measures over the last decade or two that have have been put into place to kind of address some of those inequities, but we just saw the vast acceleration in terms of disparities of park conditions in low-income neighborhoods, overwhelmingly you know, uh, surrounding uh, uh, neighborhoods um, uh, by residents of color, and the wealthy areas of Manhattan, right? And so as you open up these public spaces uh, to greater resources from uh, you know, the wealthy of the city, that's going to exacerbate various kinds of inequalities, right? And so if we're concerned 
concerned about inequalities in this in the city, then I think we should be concerned about what these kinds of processes do. Um, and whether or not, if they're not going to be, you know, kind of taken away, but whether or not changes could be made to them to address the kind of inequities that they have in, in some ways exacerbated. Right. And I think it's important to note that this idea, and that you talk about it in your book, this idea of neoliberalism, the free market, trusting the market, and also trusting kind of what increases land value and all these different things, the bottom line in a way, is also what guides policy indirectly as well. I mean, th this, is the, this is where the pressure comes from these same groups onto politicians to make decisions in a certain way, to invite certain types of businesses, to make certain types of policy, uh, I guess, directions and approaches that then lead to what we see today, whether it's like the proliferation of chains, whether it's the proliferation of luxury housing, all these different things are also kind of a result of this same kind of way of thinking. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and going back to bids, I mean, uh, uh, those midtown bids, those bids of Manhattan were, you know, it's not to say that the that we wouldn't have seen chains in Manhattan otherwise. Of course we would have, right? But they made a huge push in the 90s. He loves Target, everybody. Loves Target, this guy. <laughs> Never. I know. Yeah. I was, <laughs> Yeah. No, sorry, you cut you no, off. No, 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 no. Yeah. But I mean, right. So I yeah. mean, that, that does I think add some measure to these yeah. comments, right? Like, right. We we live in a capitalist yeah. system, right? So like, there's certain kind. But at the same time, what is you know? I think that we lose something, right? Yeah. Like, I don't think I'm kind of, you know, we lose something by just having Manhattan be kind of corporatized and just be mm -hmm. chain and look like every other city, right? Like, that's not I think what many of us like about a city like New York. We like the kind of uniqueness. So it's not to say that like there should be no chains or something right. like that. But do we want you know Manhattan to be only chains? Like, and I think that again for from the perspective of many of these bids, the answer would oftentimes be, yes, we do. Yes, and I think it for increases value. Right, right, exactly. And they're more reliable tenants, all those kinds of things, right. increasing land values, increasing rents, everything that you said. Um, but I think for, for many of us to really cherish the city, I think that we lose something from that. Right. And I think that's another thing to, to point out, this idea of the idea behind neoliberalism is, you know, you talk about bottom line, you talk about market driven policy, all this thing, you, you skip over all the intangibles. You skip over the value of community, the value of uh, diversity, socioeconomic diversity. All of these things aren't quantifiable. You can't put a, a price tag on them, so you totally skip over them for the sake of these other things. And not only that, when you start kind of making these the rules of the game, uh, the power balance is way off. Because, uh, yeah, we don't want, maybe we don't want all franchise. Maybe one franchise here, one franchise there, but as soon as one comes in, so does their entire army of m lawyers and money and everything, and they just take over. Uh, so it's a it's a tough balance to strike, I think, which is one of the interesting right. things about this policy. Um, and I, I guess this is a, would be an interesting pl uh, place to ask. Um, you were you point out that like citizens start you know they start their own initiatives. Whether even like you think about entertainment DIY spaces back in the '70s and '80s, those things get bought up. They get you know their conglomerates, whatever. But citizens start their things. They become more active. They try to clean up their neighborhood, and then they get co-opted in certain ways. What what are people supposed to do then in that case? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a it's a it's an it's an issue, right? And yeah. so I think that like, right? And it's not I, I don't think the book is is a um, a kind of de depressing um, kind of tale about just co-optation. I think yeah, that get the book, everybody. Okay, <laughs> don't be depressed. It's a good book. No, no, but I'm, I'm just pointing but that out. To, I'm just no, I'm just I'm just pointing yeah, that out to kind of say that like right co it, it, it is in yes. some ways a book about kind of these efforts being co-opted in various kinds of, of ways, but mm -hmm. it also I think consistently shows how those processes were were um, you know resisted and also how they were changed oftentimes by people who were trying to make you know who were concerned about various inequities in the city over the 1980s and 1990s, right? And who were drawing attention to what these processes were doing. So I think the book is as much about um, people who by um, you know, intervening in these kinds of, of debates also were able to you know, shift various kinds of, you know, the, 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 the uh, political and economic changes happening in the city at this time, you know, and, and, and help things to, I mean, <laughs> sounds so depressing, but, you know, not be worse um, than they... <laughs> You know, and, and I think that that's, that's right. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Read the book. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm, but uh, it's not depressing. That's what I'm saying. Um, so, but, you know, and I, and I think that, <laughs> and I think that, um, and I think that more to the point that, like, those efforts still exist today, right? There's still people out there who are really, you know, concerned about these kinds of things and who are, who are pushing the city in the, the right direction. Yeah, and sorry about that. I feel like I, it's like you're reliving, you're defending your thesis now, but now I just have to convince everyone it's not depressing. 
Uh, I don't have to, to convince you of my thesis. Just it's not depressing. But no, I, I, that's one of the things that I thought was interesting about your book. I mean, neoliberalism has been covered. You know, a lot of people have covered it before. In fact, the New Yorker did an article on it last summer. Uh, they talked about this. It's a thing that everyone's talking about now, I guess, because we're kind of seeing where it's led us. Um, but it is, it is interesting. That's what your book does talk about, is the power of the individual. Like, that is power. The reason it did go in these directions is because of the, of the people, right? Um, well, that, I guess all that being said, uh, what, what gives you hope? You know, what gives you hope? Yeah, so I think that I would, I would kind of go back to the point I was trying to make yeah. at the end before I got completely garbled and went off track, which is, <laughs> which is really about those initiatives today. So yeah. when I think about the city... You know, I think about like the housing uh, justice for all campaign, mm -hmm. which if people aren't familiar with is a statewide um, housing justice organizing campaign that's taking place over the last number of years. They were behind a lot of the major kind of tenant initiatives that were passed in the state in 2019. They were a major for force in uh, eviction preventions during uh, the height of COVID. And I think that those kinds of efforts, those kind of grassroots, you know, um, uh, people, you know, getting together across communities, bringing together people of, you know, low-income tenants, middle-income tenants, who are all of us who are really affected by something like the serious crisis of unaf or unaffordability of housing in the city, right? And really, actually able to, to shift, you know, policies in, in directions that are going to really help to protect people and help to, um, you know, retain something like you know, rent stabilization in the city, yeah. which is really important, yeah. right? And so those kinds of efforts really give me hope. Yeah, he's talking, I mean, let me translate for Gen Zers, he's talking about IRL. Uh, <laughs> he's talking about meeting up IRL in, in real life. Uh, but no, I, I think that is I think that is, that is a good point. I mean, I guess just to put it into context, though, uh, I guess just for everyone everyone here. Um, so this idea of neoliberalism being, I guess, the the I guess the the driver now behind a lot of the policy and everything. I guess putting it into context at a national level. Well, how how would you do that? I know you did it over the city, obviously, in your book. Uh, but I guess just so people understand, is it things like, for example, the charter school movement, let's say, and and the way these different policies are being used or whatever or co opted as well. Uh, by the same, I guess, phenomenon. Yeah, I think uh, you know, charter city, charter schools are an example of this, and even you know, some of the things that I talk about in New York, like business improvement districts, right. you know, um, you know, private control of parks. Those are actually things that, in some cases, were spearheaded in New York, in other cases, less so, but that have certainly proliferated across the nation. So it's not really just a New York story in that sense. Actually, the story that is. You know the kind of things that I talk about in the book are very much happening in cities across uh, the country, um, and so yeah, charter schools would be an example of that. And another interesting example of that, and this might kind of bring us back towards something that's a little more New York specific, but um, actually the growth of like these extremely wealthy PTAs. Um, so we have in the city now what is on paper a relatively equitable. Um, school system in terms of uh, different you know, schools getting similar kinds of funding. But then you have school districts in particularly wealthy areas or you know, Brooklyn Heights, sometimes having you know, six or seven um, uh, uh, figure you know, PTA budgets. So then kind of supplement that, right? And so you know, again, I think it's, it's not to necessarily say that that is, is um, uh, something that shouldn't happen, but I think it is about kind of like the ability for or wealthy to kind of consistently, you know, provide better resources for themselves and better, you know, we want to think about the ways in which that, you know, can, again, kind of address these kinds of inequalities and in something as important as the school system. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I, I, it made, you, made me think the, the franchise thing, too. Just real quick, I remember I used to talk about this on my tours. Uh, I used to be a tour guide. <laughs> no big deal. Kind of like a professor, you know? <laughs> but this one thing I used to mention on my tours, I don't know if you knew this, but did you know that 7-Eleven, this is actually true, I'm not making a joke. <laughs> You're like, all right, dude, hit me with a stupid punchline. No, this is true, 7-Eleven pulled out of New York in the 1980s, and then it was- I didn't know that. Yeah, and it was out of New York, and then it recently, in 2005, basically came back and tested the waters over near Madison Square Park and opened one, wow. one location. And it did so well that it's obviously everywhere now. But what's interesting is, I guess this goes to the intangibles once again. You're talking about, yeah, it's not bad to have one, you know, one uh, franchise here, whatever. But it's a cultural thing too, mm -hmm. and and all of this stuff. There's a cultural element to it, and that's a lot of times what people harp on. They talk about the hipsters, or they talk about the coffee shops and the cupcake shops, or whatever. But th that's the cultural side of it. Mm -hmm. Those are the things we see, and I think the same goes with the culture changing towards 
uh, I, I always I always bring up uh, Jeremiah Moss, his book mm -hmm. Vanishing New York, another great book. Yeah. Uh, get this one first, okay? Huh? And then that one. But he, he has a great quote. He says, uh, "New York's being remade for people who don't like New York." Mm -hmm. It's being suburbanized. Mm -hmm. Like there are there are franchises now because now the people who come here want their franchises. They're not coming here to to go to the bodega or see the cat running around outside or whatever. They're coming here because they want their Starbucks and they want their this and they want their that. And I guess as these things slowly seep in policy wise, the culture also cha mm -hmm. changes. Sorry, the culture also changes as well. Yeah. No. I yeah. I mean I would completely echo that. I think that's really well noted. Cool. Would I would I get an A on that paper? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, cool. Uh, all right. Well, now it's time. No more fun and games here. All right. Is this time for the uh, for the uh, rapid fire questions, Professor Holtzman? Oh, rapid fire questions. Here we go. I'm setting your face on fire. All right, cool. All right. These are. I'm gonna ask some quick questions. Uh, I invented this here. No one's ever done this before. Asking questions at the end of an interview that are quickly done. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> you ready? Yes. That wasn't one of them. All right. <laughs> This is a good one. I always like to hear this one. What's the craziest thing you've ever seen in New York? Uh, great question. Um, so, None of the other ones right. were good? Sorry. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's the craziest yeah. thing that I've ever seen in New York, but I was, I was coming home in a cab once uh, from a party in Manhattan back to Queens and uh, when I was younger and very drunk. And uh, all of a sudden, the cab is like, cab driver's getting agitated, not really clear what's going on, he seems to be yelling at someone else. We stop, gets out of the car, and I look up, and him and another cab, cab driver are just fist fighting in oh my the middle of Third Avenue. <laughs> to his credit, the light then turned green. He got back in the cab, and we kept going. <laughs> swear to God. Yes, that's great. That's great. I, that reminds me of the story. I think I told the story a, a few months ago, but that reminds me of a, another story. When I first got to New York, the thing that made me realize I was in New York, I was walking near Central Park, and there were two cab drivers parked next to each other, and they were eating sandwiches as they yelled at each other. <laughs> and I just, I'll never forget one of the guys just looking out his window, just going, eat <laughs> you pussy. <laughs> and he was eating a, a humongous right. sandwich, and great, it was coming great. out of his mouth, yelling that at the other guy. Great. Yeah. We, we love to see it. Yeah, love to see it. You love, welcome to New York. Um, okay, cool. Let's keep it moving. All right. What is the most important book you've ever read? Um, I, 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 I would say one of the It's hard to say. Okay. doesn't matter. So uh, the, the, I'll say the book that made me want to... One of the books that made me want to be an historian, which is a book by Robert Self, who then became my advisor, uh, called American Babylon. It's about the transformation of Oakland, uh, in the post-war decades and race and really is just an incredible kind of analysis of how Oakland changes during those decades and um, you know the influence of, of race and inequality during that period and American Babylon it's a really wonderful book and the uh, Robert self Robert self okay yeah. cool there you go nice little plug with Bob Bob self here <laughs> no all right we'll have to send him a clip all right what place in New York City most embodies the city to you um, I, I would say uh, the seven train. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Which, by the way, is not running this weekend. <laughs> we found that out the hard way. Unbelievable, man. I had to, I had to, oh, it was terrible I had to get in here. Yeah, the seven train is going. I, I, I agree. I did not know that. I have to go yeah. to LaGuardia tomorrow. So yeah. that's, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear you, that. Do you want to change your answer? <laughs> <laughs> Not too late to change your answer. Yeah, the seven. I agree. The seven train is amazing, amazing train. Like you take that. I remember I used to take it out of uh, uh, Grand Central, and you get on and you yeah. hear every language yeah. but English. Six different languages. It's so yeah. amazing. Yeah. You're just like, how is this? How is this United States? This is the United States, though. That's what it is. And I think that's what it, it's cool. And I, you know, what's crazy is as New Yorkers, we take that for granted. Mm -hmm. You yeah. go to other other cities, and you yeah. don't get that. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You don't get that. You get Seven Eleven. <laughs> okay, uh, next one. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, okay, how would you suggest? It's New Year's. We got New Year's resolutions abound, I'm sure, out there, all you guys, huh? Uh, how would you suggest people improve their own life in the city? Oh my God. Their own life? Like on an individual basis? Yes. I fool. You are asking the wrong guy. 
<laughs> I can talk about history, but life improvement. Anybody? <laughs> please. Listen, Ben, give me some advice, please. <laughs> no. You have any resolutions then? What, one of my resolutions is to uh, look at my st stupid f***ing phone less. Oh, funny you should say that. <laughs> Let me show you what I did last year. I recommend all you guys do, it's not too late for, everyone's like, what's he doing with his pants? Uh, <laughs> let, check it out, baby, this is what I got right here. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, this, I've, I've thought about, yeah. Do it, do it. A professor, that's like, that's like par for the course, I feel like, for a professor. You gotta have one of these. This has changed my life. I still have it. I use it for work, you know, when I have Wi-Fi, but my phone, when people text, all that stuff is on this. And when I go out, there's no, there's no service yeah, on it. So this, is, this is inspiring to it's me. It's great, man. Yeah. It's great. It's great. Don't worry. All the Gen Zers are all like, what are we doing at this boomer convention? <laughs> Relax. All right. We're, the show is going to be over in like, you know, six TikToks. Relax. Uh, okay. What's the last gift you gave someone? Oh, I, j I just bought a gift for my uh, nephew, who's four years old. Okay. He loves... You got him your book. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, No, he has, he, has to, he has to pay for that. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Um, you gave him a gift certificate <laughs> for the book. Uh, he loves uh, Cars, and I, the, the, the uh, film, the, yeah, thank you, the Pixar film, and I got him a, it's a shirt that has uh, Lightning McQueen on it, it has Ari, which is his name, oh, and then it cute. has the number four, which is what he's turning, oh. and I hope, I hope he like, wait, his birthday is next, I hope he doesn't watch this, and the, <laughs> it's going to spoil the... We're huge with the four-year-olds <laughs> on this show, it's uh, really big on the YouTube uh, circuit, yeah, okay. this I'm and gonna, Coco Melon. Yeah. You're going to hope that, yeah. that it doesn't get spoiled. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Tr I'm trying to get a deal with Coco Melon, actually. We'll see if that goes through. <laughs> All right. Uh, where would you live if you couldn't live in New York City? I would, uh, I would love to uh, live in Tokyo for a little bit. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. Have you visited um, there before? I visited there once, and I really loved it. And, uh, yeah, I would love to live there for a Do you speak Japanese? Time. Nope. Wow. Cool. Okay. That's, interesting, uh, that's an interesting uh, answer. What about in the United States? Anywhere other than New York? I well, I will say I lived in Durham for a year in North Carolina. I have somebody who would always ever yeah. Whoa, that's random as hell. Are you from Durham? No, my grandparents are. Oh, nice. We'll take it. <laughs> um, what, what are your grandparents' names? Kathy and Philip. Yeah, no. Oh, okay, <laughs> it's worth a shot. Uh, yeah, I, I had always ever lived in New York or in the Northeast, and okay. I moved down there for a year to, to teach at Duke, and uh, hated Duke, uh, but loved loved North Carolina. Oh, yeah, nice. loved Durham. All right, that's, that's nice. Uh, North Carolina is nice. I used to go there for Thanksgiving. I used to go there for Thanksgiving. My, my parents had a, had a little place there. Uh, very cold in the winter, though. It's cold here, too, though, but uh, I'm rambling. <laughs> I'm going to start crying thinking about Thanksgiving. All right, here we go. What were you like in high school? Uh, meh. Um. All right, a lot of trauma there. Let's keep it moving. Uh, <laughs> all right, I was gonna say closeted, so you're not <laughs> wrong. Okay, so I wasn't far off. All right. <laughs> all right, here we go. If you weren't a historian, what would you be? Um, I uh, I I was really into uh, uh, making documentaries and like was debating kind of going into documentary filmmaking or becoming a historian. And uh, I think to me, they were compelling for a similar reason. They were both about really documenting history, documenting neglecting sto neglected stories. And that was what I liked about documentary filmmaking. Um, I ended up going the historian route, but uh, I do often think about like that. So yeah. you know how to shoot a documentary? Um, I mean, not, not well. Uh, oh, but, but you know, but like the camera yeah. and stuff like that. So I mean, we we I, I made some like kind of DIY, you know, not incredibly uh, well put together films. But I was like going in a direction um, that because yeah, I, I have, have camera been... people, I can always use extra help. You know, as a you come out and get yourself a job, professor. All right, all right, we're uh, we're we're gonna keep it moving here and uh, get only a couple more. If you could go back to any time period and place in New York City history, which one would it be? Um, I, I really like, uh, the thing that comes to mind is thinking about music. I think that I would love to, I don't know, like, maybe it's cheesy, but like, see the Ramones at CBGB's in the late uh, 70s, cool. or Bad Brains at A7, A7 and 82, something like that, yeah. Nice. 
Unfortunately, that is incorrect. The answer was you would go back and prevent 9-11. Nice work. Uh, okay, well, you failed that. I'm gonna go listen to your tunes, I guess. That's more important. All right. Fair, fair. <laughs> All right, we got one more question. This is the last one. Very important question. Really, really important. A lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. I didn't tell you about this question beforehand because, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be sharp. This is a test of the sharp, sharpness. Will you be my friend? Yes. Hey. Yes, I would. Hey. That was, hey, yeah, hey. You would not believe how many guests I've had on here that hesitate on that question. <laughs> or maybe you would believe it, I don't know, maybe you would believe it. Uh, but guys, that, that was Benjamin Holtzman, guys. Give it up again for Thank Benjamin you, everyone. Holtzman. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. I'll take that. Thanks. And you get the thanks again. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Keep it going for Benjamin, huh? You guys definitely need to check out this book. It is so good, man, The Long Crisis. I'm telling you, you want to know what's going on in the city, and it's just, it's really, really, really fascinating stuff, so very well written as well.